Hi fellow modelers, it's Bruce here. I thought I would do a, a few videos on building locomotive kits to see if I can't convince some of you that there might be something you'd like to try. Uh, you might have a kit sitting on the shelf that you picked up along the way or used to belong to dad or some other relative and uh, haven't gotten around to build it yet. And I'll see if I can't prompt you to uh, give it a try. So in this introductory video I really want to look at two things. The kits that are currently available. After all, none of them have been made uh, by the usual old American manufacturers for 20 years or so. So it's the used market that you've got to dip into. I'll try to give you some tips for not overspending there too. So let's start by looking at some of the uh, kit manufacturers of old and whose kits are still available. And uh, in the second half, we'll take a look at some of the tools you might want to accumulate uh, that would help you build these things. And overall, see if I can't convince you that it would be a fun project to try. I guess we should start by looking at uh, a Varney kit. Um, certainly one of the original uh, manufacturers of loco kits out there. Um, many of you probably have a little Joe uh, dockside switcher in your collection. Uh, many of those started out as kits, although they were also offered as ready to run. But um, probably the second most famous of, of Varney's kits was their old lady. Um, I love their marketing. Uh, <laughs> it's in the screwdriver series, giving you the impression that all you needed to put this thing together was a screwdriver. And uh, it was probably a little bit of an exaggeration, as uh, we will see, um, as we look at some other kits. But um, it was good marketing nonetheless. And I will say this, that uh, once Varney went out of business, um, the English family up in uh, um, Pennsylvania, who put out the Bowser line of uh, kits, bought the rights to the Varney locomotives and put out the old lady her, uh, in their kit form too. And if you come across one of those and you look on the underside of some of the castings, you will see uh, Varney still uh, imprinted in the, in the casting. So this was a really, I would say, a, a kit that got a lot of people started into uh, uh, making locomotives or assembling locomotives from kit form. Um, we're talking about 19... Uh, late 1940s, early 1950s vintage here probably. I want to just show you my old lady. She's sitting on the tracks back there. Um, just so you can see what a gorgeous locomotive she is. Uh, so let me just swing this over and zero in a little bit. There she is. They came pre-painted uh, in this kit form. And uh, the valve gear were pre-assembled. Now let me just go down into the valve gear so we can see what we're talking about here. So, um, yeah, I wish my camera had better zoom capability, but... So you have the connecting rods down here, the main rods, and then you have the valve gear here. And that assembly, which can be kind of finicky to put together, um, but if you do it step by step, it, it works out quite well. But those came pre-assembled in this kit. And uh, there's plenty of action when this thing rolls with these uh, connecting rods and, and uh, valve gear. It's really a, a nice thing to see. Uh, if you look at the top of the loco, you see uh, other uh, details here uh, in gold. The bell and the, let's get it to where you can see it. So we got the uh, gold bell here, and the whistles, and steam valves, and so forth. And I can give you a, a little bit better look of all the running gear on the side. So yeah, a, a real thing of beauty here. And uh, Varney kits 
every once in a while will show up on eBay. There's one up there right now. The problem you run into with uh, buying a Varney kit, for the most part, they fall into the hands of uh, people who are buying up estate sales and so forth, and they think they have found uh, the mother load. I think that the Barney kit, uh, which is unassembled, that's up there right now, has a starting uh, price uh, bid of $350 or so, which uh, if you're a Barney collector, it might be worth it to you, but if you just want to start uh, buying some kits to build, that would not be my recommendation of the way to go. Um, so let's let's see what we got. Oh, by the way, this uh, my old lady I bought um, pre-assembled. I had to do a little bit of repairs. I liked it because it came with the box with all the instructions for assembling it and so forth. But it cost me forty dollars. All right, um, moving to another manufacturer whose kits are widely available on the uh, used market. We have Mantua kits. And this one here is of 1960-ish uh, uh, error, and I'll tell you why I know that in a minute. But it was their little shifter, and you've seen me um, take apart any number of shifters down to the, uh, the chassis and put them back together. They are easy to assemble, a very good starter kit if you can find one in unbuilt uh, form. I, I would urge you to uh, to go ahead and jump in on that uh, if you want to get started. It's a good starter kit. The way I know that this kit uh, is 1960 vintage is that all the paperwork for the kit is inside. And uh, among other things that were in there, besides the instructions and uh, how to order replacement parts, which of course is uh, pretty much useless now, they had the uh, Mantua guarantee card. So the kit was number 209, and uh, it was purchased on March 22nd, 1960. And it was from uh, Shepper Distributors. And I know there's a lot of, well, for those of you who are not familiar, there's some confusion over the relationship between Mantua and Tyco. And if you see this um, guarantee card and you flip it over, you see that it's also used for Tyco locomotives. So if you had bought something in with the Tyco name on it, you just flip it over and use that side of the guarantee card. So they were basically parts of the same corporation. And uh, at one point after World War II, um, Tyco did more, the Tyco branding did more with Ready to Run and the Mantua was kept more for kits, but that all blended together over the years too. So, yeah, and uh, to show you the actual shifter that was made from that kit, there she is. And one of the nice things about these uh, little 040 shifters, compared to some other 040, let's say, tank engines that do not have a uh, tender behind them, is that these run a lot smoother than the average 040 because you have pickups from one rail on the tender and from the other rail on uh, two of the drive wheels on, on the shifter. Doesn't have tremendously fancy uh, valve gear, but there's enough action there uh, to make it interesting. Let's stick with uh, Mantua and look at some of the other things that uh, I picked up recently. Now the kits I'm going to show you I picked up within the last, oh, let's say since Christmas. So that what I talk about in terms of uh, pricing and availability should still be um, accurate today. Uh, here I found a uh, Mantua 060 with tender and it's the one they called their Big Six Loco still shrink-wrapped in the original box. And uh, I paid about $45, I think, for that kit. The, um, the nice thing about it being shrink-wrapped, obviously, is that you know all the parts and the instructions are going to be in that box. The problem is, as you go on the used market, almost all the boxes are not still shrink-wrapped. 
and that means they've been through one or more previous owners um, who at least opened the box to look at what was inside and who knows sometimes started putting it together um, sometimes grab parts out of it to fix something else who knows so you always gamble a little bit on an open box that there's going to be one or more parts missing and the sellers usually warn you that that could be the case but because they are normally not model railroaders themselves they really don't know the parts that are supposed to be in there so the best you can do is look to see if the packages of the smaller parts um, are still um, intact that the packages haven't been opened so you can maybe see in the pictures a package of all the side rods and valve gear you find another one that probably has um, the the uh, electric motor and so forth so it's a little bit of a pig in a poke but if you're afraid there are many uh, sellers on eBay who give you 30 days to send it back and uh, get a full refund so you could do that this is a good starter kit an 060 is a very good starter kit because you don't have to deal with uh, trailing trucks and uh, um, front trucks and stuff like that so and typically on these little 060s and 040s, the valve gears are, are minimal. So this would be a good one to start with. Also in that same purchase, and I happened to find somebody on a local bulletin board put these up for sale, three of them all together, all still uh, shrink-wrapped. Shrink and one of them was this little articulated logger, the Booth Kelly. Um, in assembled form, these are usually up around $200 on eBay. Um, and this kit, again, cost me about $45. Um, no shipping and no tax because I picked it up locally. Um, from eBay, I don't usually go into the bidding wars. I usually buy the ones that are labeled as buy now. And uh, because sometimes the, the bidding wars just get ridiculous. And, uh, but this one I did go bidding on because it was a camelback and I have a, a weakness for camelbacks. And I ended up um, with the tax and the shipping probably paying about $90 for this one. Um, but it's a 462 camelback and uh, will be a fun build. I looked inside, all the parts seem to be there. Uh, the plastic um, casting for the uh, locomotive itself is cracked. I think I can fix it with uh, some glue so I did not send it back to the, to the purchaser. In a, another vintage, and then we'll move away from uh, Mantua and Tyco, Another uh, vintage of the Mantua Tyco error is the kits that were packaged with both names prominent on it. So Mantua kits made by the makers of Tyco ready to run. Um, so this one here is a Pacific uh, locomotive with tender. And again, I think if you're, if you're looking for Mantua's not something big like the uh, articulated lager, but you know the uh, uh, Pacifics and the uh, Atlantics and so forth. You can usually pick these kits up anywhere from, I'll say, forty-five dollars to sixty-five dollars if you're patient and you get the right seller. That'll put things in the in the ballpark for you. <clears throat> And then there were kits that just had the Tyco name. I don't have any um, at the moment, but uh, they certainly are available and generally are also in the same price range. All right, let's move on to another uh, manufacturer, in this case, uh, Roundhouse. And uh, in one vintage, the Roundhouse came packaged in this kind of packaging with a flip up top where you could see the uh, locomotive inside and kind of a blowout up here in the in the lid showing you some of the main parts. So in this vintage they typically had a uh, die cast chassis and a plastic molded uh, upper. 
and uh, this one is lettered for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. And again, I think it was in the $45 range, and uh, I'm reasonably sure that all the parts are there. This will probably be the one I build uh, first uh, in terms of a video series, because again, as an 060, you're not dealing with um, leading trucks and trailing trucks, you're not dealing with fancy valve gear. Uh, so it should be a, a fairly quick and interesting build to entice you to do such a thing yourself. Uh, same kind of packaging. This again is an 060, but this time it's the version that has uh, a tender with it. And again for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, uh, would have the same level of difficulty and would not be a bad one for a beginner also. Also done in the same price range. Different vintage of Roundhouse, different packaging. This is their brown box error. Um, it's a 442 Atlantic. Um, found it locally again, and uh, so I didn't have to pay for shipping. And uh, again, looking inside, reasonably sure that everything is there. I think I paid about $60 for that one. And still shrink wrapped in the red packaging. Uh, this is a uh, 460 10-wheeler. Um, the $100 price tag, he must have had it at a train show at one point. Um, I got it for $50 because uh, I bought some other ones from him at the same time. Still in shrink wrap. Roundhouse is another uh, manufacturer whose Locos kits are always available on eBay and other auction sites. Just don't go nuts on them. Again, as I said, my approach is to go for the uh, buy now prices. I look for one to pop up. When you, when you look, if you're getting in the market, try to look every day. Uh, just turn it on to eBay. Look at Put the filter on that shows you the most recently posted and see what pops up. If you have it, you know, set for something like the one who's soonest to expire, you have now looked at a kit that everybody's been looking at for 10 days and anybody who really wanted it to really uh, purchased it. Moving into a higher um, category price-wise of uh, kits is the, is the Bowser line. And again, these kits are readily, readily available. You're now going to be paying uh, north of $100, probably in for not their largest locomotives. And this happens to be a big boy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, uh, you know, for their oh, 260s and uh, you know, 264s or whatever, you're going to probably be in the $120 to $150 range. This is a big boy. There's a big boy on eBay right now and that's currently up to, I think, about $200 plus $20 shipping plus taxes. Um, I bought this one locally from a man who has had it since he was a kid. He and his dad had plans to build it together. They never did. And I paid uh, nowhere near that. Let's just put it that way. I'm almost uh, hesitant to say how low this one was because I might want to sell this on eBay and people are going to think I'm gouging them. Um, but the reality is I got it uh, very inexpensively. And uh, there's a couple of other kit manufacturers out there that I don't have any representatives from. Arbor Models is one. Uh, quite frankly, as a beginner, you should stay away from Arbor. Um, their kits were not of the same quality. You often have to do a lot of uh, fixing to get things to fit together. Uh, the other good kit manufacturer was Penline. Um, they are rarer on the secondary market and usually a little pricier, but someday I'd love to get a Penline kit. Well, that's it for looking at the kits right now. Uh, I'm going to turn this video off, get some tools uh, collected, and then we'll take a look at the tools that you need to do um, uh, some kit building. And hopefully that is exactly what you will do. Talk to you soon. Okay, I uh, just wanted to add a little addendum to uh, this week's video. Um, 
following along on the topic of buying used kits on uh, eBay or some other sales site. <clears throat> um, you, you, you always wonder whether parts are missing, that's for sure, and the best you can do is, is look at the pictures and try to determine that on your own. But the other thing is that quite often the seller is up front and says that the instructions are missing. That actually happens more often than you would suspect. And, uh, you know, without the instructions, uh, many people don't want to buy the kit and, uh, and risk uh, not being able to put the kit together. Uh, because the instructions are, are missing and, and the seller knows that a lot of people are going to be hesitant to buy the kit because of that, the price is often attractive. I'll give you an example. Earlier in this video, I said I didn't currently have any kits with the Tyco name on it. Well, that's changing. They haven't arrived yet, but uh, over the past week, I saw a pop-up from a seller I've dealt with before, a package of a couple of kits that had a very poor description, um, and therefore I think a lot of people didn't even look at it. It said, Tyco and OK the letter O and the letter K, Streamline, HO Scale, Steam Locomotive, and Passenger Kits. Well, for what the heck? Um, if you didn't look closely at the photos, you would not have known what Tyco kits were there, what was a locomotive kit, what was a passenger car kit. Most of us probably have never heard of OK Streamline. Um, and it was odd to package when you did look at the pictures, two 1890s vintage locomotives from Tyco in kit form uh, with a very modern uh, passenger car kit. But anyway, um, the price for the three was $70.99. Very odd <laughs> uh, starting price. Actually, it was buy now, so that was the price. Shipping was reasonable, $13 for three kits. Uh, I could tell, because I've been looking at these kits for quite some time, that one of the Tyco kits was a uh, 480 12-wheeler, again from an 1890s vintage. Um, it's kind of that bizarre kit that has a red tender, red cab, and white um, boiler assembly. And the other one, although never mentioned, and, and the dealer did not mention what the wheel configuration was for either one of these, uh, was a 460 of the same vintage. Um, <clears throat> the seller said one of them's in the original box, one is not in the original box. They did show good spread out of all the parts, and I'm reasonably certain that all the parts are there. He mentioned that only two of the three kits had instructions without mentioning which two. So again, people wouldn't jump on this unless they had a source for instructions to make them feel better about the whole thing. So what I want to do, since we are up close and personal friends, obviously, is to share with you a couple places where you can get instructions for uh, these kits. One of them is an eBay, eBay seller called E Surplus Underline Sales. <clears throat> and he has instructions on a lot of things, not only model railroad stuff. And he puts them on CD, which very rapidly is becoming an old technology that some people can't uh, utilize, but I still have a couple of old laptops that have CD readers on them. And uh, they have, he has one with the Tyco Mantua label that really has all the Tyco kit uh, instructions in it in PDF format. And the other one that says Mantua has all of the uh, Mantua line kits with uh, instructions. So if you bought these two, and I think they're about uh, 8 or $9 each, you would have all the kit instructions for those two major lines. And I think he also has the roundhouse kits. Um, so 
that's one source. Go on to eBay, look up eSurplus underline sales, and you will see what he has. The other source online for um, kit instructions is a, uh, let me zero in a little bit on this and see. Okay, so it's HO, capital H, capital O, lowercase seeker.net. And if you go there, this is a gentleman who is accumulating all kinds of documentation from old HO kits. So, for instance, I have all the instructions and so forth for the Varney old lady. I would scan them in in PDF format, email them to HO Seeker. He would put them up on his website. So if you go there, you will find instructions for the Bowser line. You will find instructions for the Varney line. You will find instructions for many of them. Um, check out that website, and it's free. And I think he also has a sales side for buying old HO stuff. I haven't utilized that. But there's a couple of sources for uh, instructions for these kits. And if you know of any other, put them in the comment. Help each other out here. Um, and of course, you, if you're a subscriber, just contact me and see whether I have the instructions for an old kit that you might uh, be interested in. If it's a, a Tyco or a Mantua, most likely I have the instructions. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Um, who knows what goodies I might offer in the future to subscribers. All right, on with the rest of the video. All right, let's continue on by looking at some tools that you'll need to uh, have on hand when you start building locomotive kits. And I don't want to scare you that there's, you know, a lot of exotic tools that you need. That's not the case. Most of these, if you've been doing other kinds of modeling, you're going to have these on hand. If there's a couple you have to run out and get, none of them are very expensive. If you remember the advertising for the uh, Varney kit, it said it was in the screwdriver series. You certainly do uh, need a uh, selection of small screwdrivers. That you might want to call jewelers or watchmakers sets of uh, screwdrivers. This set is very nice. I like it. Um, both of these sets have the swivel handles, which, which come in handy when you're assembling something. Uh, this one has uh, four small flat blades down to very, very small, and uh, two Phillips. On these kits, you're not going to find many Phillip head uh, screws, but uh, there could be some. The, uh, this set just goes to a little bit bigger size up on the far end, so I keep both sets around. Uh, these are all flat blade screwdrivers, and uh, they've been with me for years when I do my other modeling. Besides the, those two sets, every once in a while you just need a slightly bigger screwdriver to get a little more leverage. So I have this uh, you know, fairly fine bladed, uh, long handled uh, screwdriver and uh, it's, it comes in handy every once in a while. So I keep that one around and this is similar for a uh, Phillips head. And that's it for screwdrivers. Nothing, you know, nothing that should shake you up there. You probably have all those things on hand. So now let's talk about uh, tools that are used to clean up the castings. In all the kits I showed you, they start out with uh, a metal casting for the underframe. In many cases, until they got the plastic uh, um, uppers for the. Uh, locomotive, you know, be, they were also die cast and they always had um, a lot of extra flash that had to be uh, filed off. So you need a decent set of uh, modeler's files and, uh, I, you know, most of us have these. These are, these are inexpensive. Um, sadly, they're all typically made in China, but this one has stood up better than some of the other inexpensive ones I got. And it's the usual collection of, uh, you know, flat files, half round files, triangular files, square files. It's the usual multi-set, and they come in handy. 
But often what you want to do is start with some larger files to really handle the flash on the uh, underframe of, of these locos. And uh, again, you may or may not have these on hand. Uh, I, yeah. I come from a family of uh, builders, woodworkers, metal workers, so I've inherited files over the years from father-in-law, father, uncles, etc. So I have files up the wazoo, but uh, the bare basics are one or two flat files. Um, this is a six inch uh, flat file, fairly fine. You don't want some big rough coarse one. And uh, this is an eight inch. Both of these are uh, readily available in almost every hardware store, big box store, etc. And I have, uh, both of these are from the Nicholson brand, which I've uh, talked to you about in other uh, videos. If you're a loyal filer, a follower of my videos, and I hope you are, uh, you've heard me say that my uh, paternal grandfather, my grandfather de Young, um, worked for Nicholson File as a file cutter um, back around oh, the 19, early 1900s up to um, his, his passing in the 1930s. And um, so I, I'm kind of loyal to Nicholson, just nostalgic, but they are excellent files. So a couple flat files, a half round, half flat file, because um, there are curved parts um, to the, uh, the, the castings, and sometimes you just want to be able to go in there with a curved file. So you're going to need one of those, and again, not very big. This is probably an 8-incher. Uh, a round file, if you only have one, I guess you would get a tapered round file like this. Sometimes they're used to enlarge a pre-drilled hole, sometimes just to clean out um, some flash inside of a hole, and the tapered part comes in handy. Um, so a round file, I, I have a round file that is not tapered, and that comes in handy every once in a while too, where you do not want to uh, really elongate a hole, you just want to clean it out. But that certainly is not a necessity. And a small triangular file to get into tight places is also handy. Uh, I probably have three different uh, files of this length, triangular files of different uh, widths on, on each face, but this is a good size uh, to get. So, uh, yeah, that's it on files. I've said it before and I'll say it again, always on my modeling benches are some uh, different grits of uh, wet dry or automotive or emery cloth, sandpaper, whatever they call it in your background and where you live. Um, one, the coarser is usually either 320 or in this case 400 grit. And then for fine work, it's a 600 grit. Uh, and those are very good to have. And if you follow me when I start uh, doing some of my construction uh, videos, you'll see me use this uh, quite often. And finally, a set of, uh, in, finally in the area of, uh, you know, cleaning up castings, a couple of uh, brushes are a good idea. Um, if I was only going to buy one, it would probably be brass. But this came in a pack of three at an auto parts store on a bubble wrap, and it was 10 bucks, I think, for the three of them. So it's got a uh, set of steel wire brushes, um, a set of brass wire brush, and then one of nylon. And uh, just scrubbing in the uh, area and get off some of the uh, corrosion or whatever on these things. Don't forget, a lot of these were built in the the kits that you buy are going to be built in the 1960s or 1970s, so um, they could use a little scrubbing with a wire brush. So that's it for uh, files and other abrasives. Uh, next would be things used to hold parts, so we'll look at uh, just a couple of, of good ones to have on hand. A pair of tweezers is good for the smaller parts pair of needle nose uh, pliers. I like these because they, they're serrated at the very end, but they have a lot of flat surface for uh, sometimes straightening out um, some of the castings that are, are bent, some of the 
side rods and things like that, and a pair of uh, curved, um, somewhat needle nose pliers are good to have too. So those would be good to have on hand. Um, a set of flush cutting um, cutters are good to have for not only cutting wire but uh, in some case brass uh, screws or bolts that are longer than they need to be. So that's a good thing to have. Again, these you buy them on eBay now any time 10 bucks or thereabouts or Amazon. Those are the key uh, tools that you need. Um, I have a small hammer that I use from time to time. When you get to assembling the uh, connecting rods and other side rods, they're held together depending on the error and the kit manufacturer, typically one of three ways. They could be threaded for small screws. Um, they could be held together by rivets in which case you have to take either a screwdriver or a rivet tool, we'll t talk about that in a minute, the rivet tool, and um, put it on a heavy piece of metal, lay it there, and tap the top either on top of the screwdriver or on top of this rivet tool to spread the, the rivet out. Uh, so you can use a full-size hammer, you don't have to go out and buy a little hammer, but again, all the tools I've inherited over the years, I have this nice little ball peen hammer and it, and it comes in handy. Um, oh, the third way they're holding uh, side rods and stuff together, um, depending on the error again, are Delrin pins that you just press in until they snap and they hold everything in place. They work well. From time to time you have to enlarge uh, or, or clean out a uh, pre-drilled hole. So some drill bits in the quarter inch range plus or minus a little bit come in handy and you can put them in small electric uh, drills like a Dremel or something similar or I have this uh, <laughs> humongous uh, drill holder here and uh, it comes in handy too from time to time. Um, the adhesives that are handy are your your super glues in both liquid and gel form and uh, again you've heard me say it many times I'm very happy with the Loctite brand so I stick with that and as you put things together down on the underframe you're going to want to add a little lubrication I've always stuck with labels and you know it's plastic friendly and the same thing there grease so uh, those are your your two lubricants. You can use sewing machine oil, you can use uh, other very fine light oils. Um, everybody has their favorite. And if you want to check electric conductivity and stuff like that, uh, a multimeter is not a bad thing to have on the side of your bench. So that's about it with uh, tools. Uh, if I can go find one last thing, I'll come back with an addendum. Uh, and it has to do with the uh, rivets that we talked about. So I forgot to get it ahead of time. Bear with me. Probably see me in a... Back with the tool I wanted to show you, which I should have collected ahead of time, but did not. Um, I think you can see that says rivet tool, number 36, um, Bowser told you they were kind of an upper end producer of kits, uh, includes these little packages in their kit. And it contains two little tools. One is the uh, rivet tool that you put on top of the rivet that you want to flange out and then tap it while having the assembly on a hard surface like a piece of metal. And you'll see how I do that uh, as we proceed with these videos. Um, so you got the rivet tool and you have a little wrench, if you will, to tighten uh, some of the screws that they use to hold the running gear together. Um, those typically have a hex head and what they supply here is really a um, bolt that has a, would be uh, put in place with a, if you were using it as a bolt, with a hex driver 
we're using the recess of that to put over the head of uh, um, the, the little screw that we're putting in, which has a hex head, and tightening it up. So this is like a little uh, wrench for assembling things. Comes in handy. I found this set before I ever had a Bowser kit uh, on eBay, where else, uh, for a couple bucks, and I snapped it up right away. The way the uh, rivet tool works is uh, this end is recessed to go over the, the rivet and has a little protrusion in the middle that will help flange it out. So you put the assembly down on the hard surface, put this on top of the rivet, and then take your little hammer and tap, tap, tap it a few times until you get the flange the way you want it on the back of the rivet. Um, so yeah, those are handy to have. This actually, if you go to a store where you can pick through the bins of, uh, of uh, nuts, bolts, and things like that, like tractor supply, for instance, or a machinist supply, you might find some of these that you could just pick one up. Um, but it's much better than trying to tighten those with a pair of pliers. You're going to really mess up the head. I, I think also that maybe, who did I see that had, I'm going to have to think. When we, when we get back and start assembling kits, I'll, I'll, I'll have looked it up. It looked like somebody, maybe Woodland Scenics, had uh, one for sale for this size. I think they call it a number 80. Uh, hex. So uh, yeah, that was the last thing I wanted to show you. So with that, uh, we'll wrap this introductory uh, video up and the next time uh, you see a video about assembling a uh, locomotive from a steam locomotive from a kit, I'll actually be assembling it. So uh, hope you follow along. As always, uh, if you like the video, give it a like, and if you want to make sure you see the videos as they come out, then you could subscribe. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon.